Connecticut State Legislature's nonpartisan commission on women, children, seniors, equity, and opportunity. We are so pleased today to uh, engage in what is the second of a four-part series regarding the sexual abuse to prison pipeline. Today, we'll be focusing on the psychological breakdown of sexual abuse and violence. Sexual abuse and violence can have psychological, emotional, and physical effects on a survivor. We'll be having a conversation about understanding childhood sexual abuse and violence and how it can serve as a pathway to justice involvement. Just a word of uh, notice for our parents or guardians, this forum will address sensitive issues that may not be suitable for children without adult supervision. Uh, we ask for your discretion in viewing today's conversation. Firstly, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our viewers on Facebook Live. Uh, I'd like to introduce you first and foremostly to my co-host tonight, uh, Larice Harvey. Larice, you are one of the grade eight uh, inducted into Connecticut Hall of Change, memorializing your 20 plus years of restorative justice, public health and racial justice modalities and public changes. Co your co-founder of Once Incarcerated, offering peer support to youth and adults currently and formerly incarcerated. As the author of Button's Journey, my first two years living with PTSD, you are a light, an inspiration, and really a teacher uh, in residence in the state of Connecticut and someone that we all look to, uh, to guide us to what can be very difficult but important discussion. So, Larice, you're my co-host for tonight. In fact, you're gonna be the lead. Uh, so I'd love to welcome you and, and, and have you kick us off tonight. Thank you, Steve. Again, I am um, honored and it's a privilege to be working with the Commission of Women, Children, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity. I thank you and Denise for helping me bring this important issue to the limelight. Um, how we got here, again, I read the report, um, Sexual Violence to Prison Pipeline, The Girl's Story, and I thought about who they didn't really talk about because I'm one of those that are forgotten. And then I thought about men how, who are forgotten. And so today I wanna talk about the psychological and brain development of someone who is a survivor of sexual violence, someone who is a survivor of domestic violence, someone who is suffering from PTSD and someone who is incarcerated for a violent crime, not because I'm a violent person, but because of my experience in my childhood and development um, had, had, had elicit that kind of response to my um, self-defense situation. And so today, I am grateful and honored to have uh, Dr. Lisa Fontes, uh, Richard Smith, and Lindsay Rosenthal. To um, Lindsay was part of the report we're talking about um, here today with us. But it is my privilege now, and hopefully I will be working with her in the future to introduce you to Lisa Fontes. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst is an internationally known expert on child abuse, intimate partner violence, and sexual violence. As a researcher, activist, expert witness, and author, she works to protect the most vulnerable people from violence. She is the senior lecturer at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, she has worked as a family individual and group psychotherapist. Dr. Fontes is a well-known conference speaker and workshop facilitator and blogs for publications introducing, um, including psychologytoday.com and domesticshelters.org. She will be talking about um, sexual abuse trauma from child to adult, the child's brain and body's response to trauma of sexual abuse as children mature their trauma responses and influence, influences their relationships to the world, including subsequent sexual encounters, and she's going to um, do a nice little PowerPoint presentation. And I would like to introduce to many, um, Dr. Lisa Fontes. She's gonna rock my world today and I hope she rock yours too. Lisa. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Larise. That's fantastic. And thank you, Stephen. And it's a pleasure to be here with um, Lindsay and Richard as well. Um, this is really a terrific event and I'm really very proud to be part of it. I'm going to just share my screen quickly here and uh, dive right into it. 
So we're going to be talking about the trauma of child sexual abuse and um, what it does to a person. I've spent decades on this, and so giving you the 20-minute version is complicated, but I'll, I'll do the best I can, and then we'll have some time for questions from what I understand. So let's start by uh, defining child sexual abuse. Uh, many definitions, this is what I like. Sexualized interactions with a minor. Very simple involving a minor in sexual activities to which he or she cannot give informed consent or in activities which go against laws or social norms. Here are some examples among many. So kissing a child sexually, does that mean you can't kiss a child? Of course you can kiss a child who you love, who gives you permission to kiss them, who's happy to have the kiss, but not sticking your tongue down there into their mouth. Obviously that's a sexual kiss and a different story. Um, touching a child sexually on top of or under their clothing exposing a child to pornography. I'm diving right in here, I know it's hard. Um, taking sexual images, which we call sexual abuse images, um, exposing genitals to a child, um, engaging in oral, so with the mouth, manual, with the hands, genital or anal sex. All of these are examples of child sexual abuse. I also wanna mention non-contact child sexual abuse because it's also traumatizing because the relationship of trust has been violated. Um, and so sometimes people think, oh, well, if there was no contact or no penetration, it wasn't as severe. But the severity of the trauma is based on the violation of the relationship and the change in the child's life, not on the particular acts that were done. So some examples of non-contact sexual abuse include, include peeking secretly at a naked teenager, Masturbating in the presence of a child, the child learns that that's what they're serving for is a sexual stimulation to the adult, or taking images of a child for sexual purposes. So non-contact abuse is often the beginning of what will become contact sexual abuse. It may be part of the gr grooming process, but it's also harmful in and of itself. So it's important that we don't say, oh, it was just X act and therefore it doesn't matter. It matters to that child and their development. One way I like to think about it is that there are certain essential questions that we try to ask as children and our children ask growing up. So one question is, who am I? So children are looking around all the time to try to figure out who they are and they figure it out based on how they're treated. So if they're treated with love, they conclude I'm lovable. If they're treated with respect, they, they have self-esteem. If they're treated with disdain, they feel badly about themselves. And so I'm going to carry that question throughout my talk today. Um, the other question they're asking is, what kind of world is this? What kind of world am I living in? And how they are treated, again, answers that question for them. So child sexual abuse is harmful because of the answer it gives to these questions. Um, in a little bit more depth, what makes child sexual abuse harmful? Uh, David Finkelhor and Angela Brown asked this question 35 years ago, and I think that their, their, question, the, their answers are really essential for us to understand the harms of child sexual abuse. So one of the harms is stigmatization or shame that goes along with child sexual abuse. It can result in self-hate and self-destructive behavior. So it's answering the question of who am I when the child is abused sexually, part of that answer is, I don't count, I'm, uh, it might be I'm dirty, I only count for sex. The abuser will often call the child names, you know, you, I don't want to repeat dirty words here, but you know, you whore, you, you know, um, you make me do this, um, you're sinful. Um, so the child feels shame as a result of the abuse. There's also the betrayal. So a relationship which should be based on love and protection is instead based on exploitation. That serves as a distorted model for future relationships. And often this is a, a, a relationship with somebody who's very essential to the child, a parent, a step-parent, a teacher, an uncle, a brother, a mother. So when the child is asking, who am I? What kind of world is this? You're a person who only counts for your sexuality. Um, what kind of world is this? It's a world in which those who should be taking care of us are not, in fact, they're harming us. Powerlessness is part of the lesson of child sexual abuse. So victims learn they cannot defend themselves and others will not defend them. Children often develop phobias, anxiety, nightmares, dissociation, or aggression. 
Um, they may also go out with an attitude of nothing can harm me and be real risk taking. Um, but it all stems from the same root of powerlessness. So who am I? I'm a person who doesn't have power to shape my world. I'm a person who doesn't count. And what kind of world is this? It's a world in which people overpower me. And premature and traumatic sexual sexualization is part of the lesson of child sexual abuse. It results in emotional and sexual irregularities. So who am I? I'm sexual. Children learn whenever you know, they're abused sexually, they learn to be sexual before they're really ready for it. And what kind of world is this? It's a world which thinks of me, considers me a sexual being above all else. There are additional harms of child sexual abuse, which affects a person's um, psychology, mental health, the way they view the world, the way they view themselves throughout their lives. And one aspect of that is keeping the secret. So children are asked to, made to, or it's understood that they're going to keep the secret of child sexual abuse. This is very isolating. Um, it usually causes the victim to lie, and it results in relationship problems. It complicates their attachment. Um, I'll never forget the eight-year-old boy who I spoke to whose stepfather was abusing him sexually, and he, and he said with such horror, I lied to my mother. Because for him, the lying to his mother was the worst part of the sexual abuse that he felt obligated to lie to his mother because he was making a calculation. He was keeping the family together by consenting to the acts that his stepfather was imposing on him. So who am I? What kind of world is this? I'm a person who is participating in, in, a, in the child's mind, activities that are, need to be kept secret. And what kind of world is this? It's a world in which I cannot be truly myself because I have to hide something very important that's going on. Another harm of child sexual abuse is the disruption of physical processes. So children who are abused sexually often have trouble sleeping. I mean, you'll meet adults who sleep all the time with the lights on. And often this is because the sexual abuse happened at night. They may have trouble eating, um, relaxing. Um, they're always on overdrive, urinating, defecating, feeling sexual pleasure. So who am I? I'm a person whose body is out of control. That's part of the message of child sexual abuse. What kind of world is this? It's a world in which I can't soothe myself and people don't soothe me physically. Child sexual abuse is traumatic. Um, when you're thinking about what tra uh, trauma is, we talk about the three E's. There's an event or a series of events or set of circumstances that experience, is experienced by the individual physically as a physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects. Those are the three E's. So child sexual abuse may not be traumatic if there's let's say one incident. I remember somebody telling me about being 14. She was babysitting um, at night. The um, father in the house who was a neighbor uh, of the family went down to the basement um, where she had fallen asleep after babysitting. He um, groped her. Um, she pushed him away. He didn't do anything else. The next morning she went home. She told her parents. Her parents believed her. They called the police. They put her in therapy. And she saw herself as a victim of somebody who was doing what he shouldn't do. And that was the end of it. And she said, you know, I really don't feel any lasting effects. Um, but child sexual abuse can also evolve from something that feels kind of okay to the child because the child doesn't know better to something that is very traumatic or looking back as a teenager or an adult, it can be traumatic. So for instance, I interviewed a woman who at the age of eight, her father would um, bring her to some land that they had and um, touch her sexually and kiss her and caress her. And um, it was all done in a very loving way. And uh, she enjoyed that time alone with her father. But then when she got older, he became more and more intrusive and wanted to penetrate her. And she said, you know, Poppy, stop, that hurts me. And that's when he said, don't tell anyone or I'll kill you. And he pushed her further. So um, it, it was definitely, you know, um, traumatic. I'm going to speak very briefly about the brain. Um, I'm not a neuropsychologist, so this is going to be really quite basic. The outer uh, part of the brain is called the neocortex or the new cortex. We consider it the thinking brain. Inside that is the limbic system or the primitive brain. 
which includes the, the um, amygdala, and we call that the emotional um, brain. So let's say there's a threat, you know, maybe you're crossing the street and a car looks like it's coming at you. The amygdala, the primitive brain senses the threat, even before you can put words to it, you sense it. Um, the thinking brain looks, sees a car coming and essentially goes offline. So it's not going to be doing a lot of higher level processing at the moment of trauma. The emotional brain, the more primitive brain, activates the fight, freeze, or flee response. It releases hormones, your pulse gets faster, your hands begin to sweat, and your memories are stored in that more primitive, non-linear, um, little bits and pieces here and there during a traumatic event. Now let's say um, it looks like a car is coming at you, but the car swerves away or you throw yourself onto the sidewalk and you're okay. Then the dangerous past, your thinking brain steps in and says, Whew, you're okay. You're not hurt. You check yourself, I'm not hurt, okay. And the alarm is shut off and you learn to calm down. That is the trauma, that's the stress response. But what happens when there's a traumatic event? The event is too big for the brain to process um, appropriately and to calm itself down afterwards. The emotional brain continues to sound the alarm, continues to say, you're in trouble, you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Like our ancestors, you know, fleeing wild animals or whatever, you know, we had to be in that alert state, but it, it came and it went. Well. Child sexual abuse often happens over time. And so the child is in that alert state all the time, always with that, that, that um, sensation to fight, freeze, or flee, even when there's no longer an immediate threat. It becomes a chronic state of being in survival mode. So with these repeated stressors, repeated child sexual abuse or re repeated child sexual abuse mixed in with physical abuse, mixed in with danger on the streets, mixed in with intimate partner violence in the home leads to being in overdrive all the time. Child sexual abuse is usually a chronic stressor. It's usually not like that 14 year old who is babysitting who I described to you. There's often repeated incidents. There's often multiple abusers and there's often other adverse childhood experiences in the home. Um, such as exposure to intimate partner violence, exposure to racism, poverty, physical abuse, corporal punishment, the death and absence of loved ones, and so on. So there is chronic stress. How does child sexual abuse show up in a child? Um, sometimes they reenact the sexual acts in play. Sometimes they're aggressive. Sometimes, depending on their age, they have tantrums or nightmares. They may act out sexually, touching other children in public, touching themselves in public. Um, they may have uh, talking about sex all the time. They may have difficulty concentrating. They may be angry. They may wet or soil their pants, but sometimes they're eager to please. They may be withdrawn. They may be shut down. They may be sad. They may succeed in school. They may look very superficially happy and really be able to compartmentalize what's going on so others don't suspect. How a child copes partly depends on their relationships and the presence of other adverse childhood experiences. In other words, if a child has been raised with love and comfort and is generally protected, then it will be easier for them to cope than a child who has a lot um, going against them. So what happens when a child who's had that experience of, or those experiences, I should say, of child sexual abuse becomes a teenager? Well, what are teens like? Um, they tend to be self-centered, not because they're bad people, but that's just where they are in their development. They're very concerned about themselves. They, it's like they're looking in the mirror all the time. They tend to be very self-conscious and feel like everybody's looking at them all the time. They tend to be filled with shame because in some way they don't measure up. They feel like their bodies don't measure up. Their um, grades don't measure up. The way they talk doesn't measure up. Their hair doesn't measure up. You know, they're, they, it, 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 their clothes don't measure up. Their moods tend to be quite unstable, you know, up and down, up and down. Um, they feel awkward all the time. They're easily humiliated. They have unrealistic understandings of how the world works. They don't have, don't have enough experience to really understand how things work in the world. Um, they may think that, you know, things are gonna go really well or really poorly because they don't quite get. And they tend to push boundaries and rules. 
they take risks, you know, depending on who they are, big risks or little risks. They maybe get involved with drinking, drugs, sex, speeding if they have a car. They may not obey a curfew. They may skip school. They may get involved with crime. And um, risk taking is, is very common in childhood. But what those risks are and what they might lead to depends on the circumstances in which a child grows up. Um, teenagers typically seek independence. You know, they have that tension between leave me alone and help me. So if there is um, a lot of support at home, you know, they may, you know, maybe like leave me alone, but could you give me some money first and maybe you could drive me somewhere? Um, but uh, they may not get any, any support at home. And they're seeking peer approval. So remember what happens when we're talking about a child who's been abused sexually. Well, we also need to look at their physical and sexual development, which is very confusing um, for teenagers. Um, their hormones are changing. They may be developing very rapidly. A lot of times for boys, that's a point of pride as they get bigger and their shoulders get broader and they may get some facial hair. A lot of times for girls, that's a point of vulnerability as they um, realize that they're being noticed by boys and men. Um, they may feel like they're taking up too much space and, and it, that transition may not be a happy one. I'm not saying it's happy for all men and boys either um, or unhappy for all girls. They have sexual thoughts and feelings and they may not exactly know what to do with them. They feel increased arousal and curiosity sexually, but again, they don't know what to do with that. Um, technology complicates this process for kids today. You know, there's online porn accessible all the time, everywhere, very extreme in some cases. Um, sexting extortion, so their sextortion, so their phones can become a, a source of risk. Um, social media pressures, um, video games, and so on, that may be quite sexual. Teenage sexual abuse victims know that if they speak out, there are consequences to themselves and to the offender. Um, they may be the offender if it's somebody they love, they may not want that person to go to jail, they may not want them to get deported. Um, they may fear that they themselves will be sent to foster care, their family will be broken up. And a lot of times offenders will say you will get in trouble if you tell and um, teens believe that. Um, teenagers distrust adults and they distrust the system and um, particularly um, kids from marginalized communities um, distrust adults and distrust the system for some very good reason. If you're being hassled by the police every day on your way to middle school or high school, you're not going to trust that system with your disclosure of sexual abuse. Why would you? Um, teenagers are more able to lie when they're being questioned about sexual abuse. And usually, if they are, the lies are to deny abuse. It's rarely to create notions of abuse where they didn't, they didn't happen. Uh, teens are more apt to be confrontational um, during um, therapy or interviews, whatever. I, I remember when I was a beginning therapist and my first teen client came in and said, young teen, your shoes are stupid. And, you know, maybe he had a point. My shoes were kind of stupid, but I, it was, you know, just not what I was expecting because that was not what I had been encountering with the teens and the adult, uh, the, sorry, the kids and the adults I'd been working with previously. They may not want to discuss sexual abuse, especially if they had engaged in illegal or forbidden um, acts. And a lot of times abusers will give kids and teenagers, they'll give them drugs, they'll give them porn, they'll, they'll ask them to steal something. And then the kids are afraid to tell. Um, and then teenagers are more apt to be defensive um, and, and um, angry, um, cry, and have a lot of difficult nonverbal behaviors, um, difficult for the adult who's not expecting it. Childhood sexual abuse sets up a person for sexual re-victimization through their childhood, their teen years, and their adult years. There's psychological factors that cause that tendency for re-victimization. Um, somebody who's been abused sexually um, is maybe confused about boundaries, like what's, it, how, what's appropriate for people to touch me? In what ways? Oh yeah, everybody puts me on their lap and sticks their hand between my legs. You know, that seems normal. Um, going to a party and having strangers grope them may seem normal because they haven't been, their boundaries have not been respected in the past. A sexually exploitative relationship can feel familiar. Yeah, I know, I know, I, I know this, it's familiar to me. That's what I'm used to. Um, they may be confused about love and sex so that um, if there's love, there must be sex. And if there's sex, there must be love um, and not able to distinguish between those two, which can put them in very risky situations. They may have poor impulse control. Um, 
they, you know, they've decided they're going to use, they're not going to have sex. Um, and so they don't carry condoms, but then a situation comes up. And so they do. Um, they have intense and volatile feelings, whether those feelings are of love or anger, and they may be expert at dissociating. So being present, but not being present. And um, they, that's how they survived the child sexual abuse. And it puts them at risk in the future and can occur even when um, having sex with a loved, a loved one. There are also social factors that lead to re-victimization. Um, the same factors that led the child not to be protected as a child may lead them not to be protected later in their childhood, in their teen years, and as an adult. Uh, the child sexual abuse itself puts them in vulnerable situations. They may be homeless, um, running away, using substances, which makes them vulnerable, and then the system responds poorly. The way the system responds to child sexual abuse, abuse victims sets them up for prison and the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, this publication that I know Lindsay's gonna talk about today is really tremendous in talking about how that happens. It's really the best resource I've seen in explaining how child sexual abuse can lead to incarceration and what we need to do about it um, to end that. So um, finally, returning to those two questions of children asking, who am I? And what kind of world is this? Um, as children become adults, they carry with them the harmful answers to these questions of who they are and what the world is like. They learned the answer to these questions through child sexual abuse, and we need to give them new answers and experiences. Um, those new answers, you are valuable, you're capable, you're lovable, and we will make the world safe for you. Thank you. There's my email if anybody needs to contact me for any reason. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fontes. You know, you really have taken us through a landscape that doesn't, that really brings together all of the various impacts and all the various ways in which the original harm can have lasting impact. And it's so powerful to see it in front of you, especially when we know that childhood has its own difficult dynamics, right? Puberty has its own difficult dynamics. And when overlaying with abuse and the breach of trust can lead to those long-term impacts that then, of course, can lead to risky behavior, harm to self, harm of others, and can get a person who rightfully so is in fight or flight mode involved in the justice system. So I, I think my question to you, and I, and I wonder that parents are, are asking themselves this question as they, as they, um, as they are viewing your uh, crosswalk, is how can we differentiate or distinguish between what may be very normal uh, uh, childhood projection, teenage behavior, and the behavior that may be exhibited by a child who has experienced uh, childhood uh, sexual violence? I think that's a wonderful question. And um, part of the answer to that is that children show that they're in distress. Teenagers show that they're in distress, but we don't know what that distress is unless we speak with them. So what is our job as parents? Um, our job is to keep communication open keep communication open from when they're young, straight through their adult years forever, hopefully. So they, we don't wanna make them afraid of us. If they're afraid of us, they're not gonna to talk to us. Um, if they're afraid, we're gonna respond with punishment. If they're afraid, we're gonna respond harshly, they're not gonna speak with us. So we have to keep communication open so we can say, hey, you know, what's going on? You can tell me anything and I'll help you solve it. Um, and that is not something that we can, you know, we can't be punishing and angry and um, hit through their early childhood and then all of a sudden switch when they're teenagers and say, okay, now I want you to confide in me. It's not going to work. We have to be um, worthy of their trust um, from the beginning and keep and keep channels open. Dr. Fontes, there's something, if I, if I just may, Larissa, as a follow-up, there's something that happens when a child turns 18. Let's just say, let's just say 18 is the cutoff. It's almost as if a switch goes on or off, right? And we take, we, we divorce that child from all of the experiences that may have come before that switch went on. And we now treat the adult as if 
they are outside of their context. We ignore that there may be early trauma. We ignore that it may be compounded. We ignore that uh, the, some of the um, antisocial behavior that is being exhibited by that quote unquote adult is directly linked to early trauma. Why do we do that as a society, do you think? <laughs> That's a big question, isn't it? And maybe some of the other panelists here would um, like to answer it. Um, I, I think, you know, I don't have a lot of use for Freud in general, um, but one of the things, you know, the main thing that I think he gave us, or took a couple of main things, but the one I'll talk about is the underlining of the importance of childhood. Um, and maybe one reason we don't pay so much attention to that is because we want to forget our own childhoods, um, because ch childhood can be a really scary place. Um, even in, in, you know, quote unquote, good families, um, it can be really difficult. Um, but do the other panelists have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I don't have a thought on, um, I do, but I'm going to do it in the context of my own personal experience. And that's as a um, policy changer in Connecticut who worked on Raise the Age, who did the racial ethnic impact statement so that we stop penalizing, you know, certain age groups, so certain social economic um, status of people based on um, society being angry at our youth, society being angry at our urban communities, um, and it is a fear. And we want the excuse for those we deem appropriately savable, and we don't want the um, save mechanisms. We don't want to have this conversation for the people in society we deem, you know, um, unbecoming, you know, those, uh, you know, ghetto fabulous, uh, um, juvenile, um, and, you know, Terrences, those who are tyrant. We give evil names, inmates, uh, ex-offender, offender, convict. We give names to the things that we don't want to address in a healthy way in society so that we can continue to separate ourselves from those who are, who are, who are not like us. And when I speak on this, I'm speaking in the, um, the privileged state of white male privilege and white American privilege where everything is associated and based on that train of thought. And as a survivor who went through, like, I'm looking at your videos of development and I'm going, oh my God, that was me. That was me. Except for it was my parents who had sex with me from, from the ages two to five. And I didn't know it was wrong until I had to testify during the divorce. And the prosecutor, you know, kind of was at the same time. It was like really weird. The judge asked me questions of, um, what, was I happy at home? And I was like, yeah, I love my time with my dad and mom. I was saving their marriage. So I had a misconception on, on relationships my whole entire life until recently at 43. Let's just go there. I'm 49. So six years ago is when I realized the, the, a lot of my decision making, my relationships, my disassociation, all these things you're naming, um, it's what I experienced and why I have PTSD today. And then to go back further, my crime, a year before my crime happened, I got my son's father broke into my apartment and I stabbed him 13 times. And nine months later, two girls jumped me in front of my house and I stabbed one and she dies. But in my case, nobody took in consideration my epistemology before my 21st birthday. If they had, I don't think you could actually arrest me and charge me for murder, manslaughter, anything based on what you just said. What I needed was intervention from social services and mental health support because I'm not a violent person, although I have a violent history because of the sexual abuse, because of the domestic violence, because my mother's boyfriends videoed us having sex with his sons. You know, I thought I was a pedophile for years, you know, cause, um, but I wasn't, it was, it, I was an eight year old having sex with a six year old. So I thought I was the wrong person cause I was older. So imagine growing up de de dealing with that. And then I'm just bringing this all to like, this is real stuff. So I want you Richard to help me out here, brother. Cause I know you got a story too. But it's like, this is so much real for me. And I hope those are listening are taking heed. When we start doing policies, we need to consider who we are talking about and stop, and stop putting them in prison and start 
putting them in places where they can get healthy. It shouldn't have took me 43 years to get some help. Hmm. Larissa, a couple of things that you mentioned hmm. before. I'm going to introduce Richard in a little bit, but first I'm going to queue up this video, Richard, because Larissa talked about um, sort of the preconceptions, right, that we walk into a room with. And I've always thought about the burden, uh, the burden of some of the preconceptions that we have about race and about gender as well. Oftentimes we think, you know, girls are abused and it happens. We never think about boys being abused. We never think about the long-term consequences on men uh, because of how it is that we conceive of men as having to be stronger, having to be silent, all the other things that society layers on our children, men and women. So with that, I want to cue up this next video. I just want us to watch uh, this video to kind of set the tone for our conversation, Richard. It's on the Bristle, Bristlecone Project, Men Overcoming Sexual and Abuse and Assault. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, Denise, if you could cue up that video uh, so that we can share it. Thank you so much. I guess, start at the beginning. It takes one victim to come forward, and then when one victim comes forward, other victims come forward. And I find myself sitting here talking about having been abused as a kid, and I didn't even have a clue that was true until two years ago. I am 61 years old. And why haven't they before? They say, because I thought I was the only one or I didn't think anyone would believe me. When I was in the third grade, there was this computer teacher who kind of took me under his wing. He had taken me to his house and molested me for the first time. I had accepted it for so long and internalized it and that I must be at blame or at fault, that I'd wanted it in some way. I had been treated by some people that I loved and told that I wasn't worth a damn thing. But my abuse started when I was six. Uh, it was a family member. And I just felt so empty and ashamed, like after those things would happen. And those of us who were harmed, were wounded as children, have to deal with the conflict between those wounds and the message that we all receive as men. I thought there was something wrong with me, you know? That it happened to me because I wasn't a man. In that masculine oriented competitive world, there is no room for vulnerability. Being sexually abused, I can't ignore the impact that that has had on my life, but it's not all of Tony. We are seeing in being completely open, completely public about what happened to us, we will communicate that it's possible to cast off that shame and that stigma and talk to somebody. And a voice that said, you know, they can hurt your spirit. They can hurt your flesh, but they can't hurt your spirit. I'm looking for the aha moment and I found it almost immediately as soon as I acknowledged publicly what happened to me. The longest journey in life is gonna be just that one step within. Finally, the love and the light had broken through all of the pain and the fear, and that's when my life changed. Really, I just ask uh, each man to, to tell his story you know, exactly the way he wants to. We have no plans to end the Bristlecone Project at some number of survivors, and we will continue on into the future for as long as there are men who want to volunteer. This is so powerful. I want to welcome next uh, Richard, uh, Richard Smith, founder and trainer at Richard Smith Speaks. Uh, Richard, you're a nationally recognized expert on trauma and healing for survivors of interpersonal and systemic violence. Also founder and lead strategist and anti-racism educator for Richard Speaks LLC. Uh, you've lectured on issues such as systemic racism, mass incarceration, trauma, and healing. Uh, your research does focus on male survivors of sexual childhood sexual abuse. Richard, welcome. I would love for you to guide us through your work and some of what we saw uh, as testimonial in this last video. Yeah, yes. Um... So um, first off, I want to thank, you know, thank everyone for this opportunity uh, to be to participate in this panel. But uh, more specifically, Luis, I want to I want to thank you and I want to tell you that I'm really proud of you. Right. And I'm grateful for all the work that you've done and sharing your story so courageously 
right? To help other people know that healing is possible and healing is real. Um, and I'm extremely proud of you for that. And so I'm just grateful for your work, for your presence. And I'm just glad that we have you in this movement. Um, and so, you know, the first thing I'll respond to, um, Stephen, is the question you asked earlier, right? Why do we, why do we continue, despite the understanding that there are previous experiences of abuse that contributes to people's behaviors that lead to decisions that can ultimately find them incarcerated, right? And and defined as or diagnosed as antisocial, right? Even that term in it itself. Um, and it, you know, it suggests that there's something uh, criminal about this person, right? This person is less emotionally available. This person is callous. This person is capable of harm without having a response, having a typical human response to the uh, experience of hurting someone else. And the first thing I'll say is that we don't believe that trauma is real. Right, because if we really understood trauma to the extent of the way that it impacts our bodies, the neuroscience of trauma, right, we would know that regardless of this idea of free will that we believe everyone has, right, because that also plays a significant role in it, this notion of free will, and it's much more um, imposed on adults. We're more patient and acceptable of children's behavior right, because we know in their brain development process, they haven't developed the, the ability to manage impulse control, they act out in ways that are consistent with children. But we also know that when a person experiences trauma, it compromises your lower level brain functioning in a way that you can't access that higher level brain functioning and capacity that allows you to make decisions and really live up to the expectations that you have free will and the decisions that you make in life. And so we fail to take that in consideration when it relates to adults, because we don't really understand it, right? That's why the work of Vessel van der Kolk and Dr. Bruce Perry was so significant, because that neuroscience, that information introduced to the field the ways in which our body continues, continues to keep the score, and how this has a lasting, long-lasting effect on our developmental process. And many of us are stuck in that state in which the original trauma that we've experienced happened. And then we're expected, we're expected to make decisions, even though we don't even know what's going on internally that's compromising our ability, right? And so that's why the biggest shift in this, in this work for me was the shift from changing the narrative from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Because once you commit, once you, once you are invested in understanding that and understanding that trauma can have an impact in the ways that I just described, and you shift from what's wrong with you, because we are a society that wants to demonize people, that wants to other people, right? That wants to say there are people who want to get help, there are children who want to learn, there are people who want to do the right thing. We want to put the onus on individuals, right? because we want to say if they don't do it, do it the right way, then something is wrong with them. And we also engage in it too. But the major shift in trauma work was, it's not something is wrong with you, it's something happened to you. And when you get that to a person who's been living a life impeded by their previous experience of trauma, it relinquishes so much shame. It creates space for them to realize that, yes, these things happened to me in life, but there's also a possibility that I can actually heal. And I know for so many men, the statistics are one in six men under the age of 18, right? Will experience sexual abuse, right? But my thing is you can't talk about sexual abuse without talking about race. You can't talk about sexual abuse specifically for male survivors of sexual abuse without talking about systemic oppression, right? You can't talk about sex, male survivors of sexual abuse or sexual abuse without talking about patriarchy and the role that patriarchy plays in defining what manhood looks like, what masculinity looks like, and how toxic that becomes, and how we internalize this notion of masculinity so early on that even at five years old, if we are violated by someone who causes, us harm, causes harm to us sexually, we feel that the onus is on us as a five-year-old boy to be able to protect ourselves. 
we learn these messages so early. It's so deeply ingrained in the fabric of our culture that these children are learning that, these boys are learning that early on, right? And then they encounter this experience of sexual abuse and they feel ashamed, right? And then we know like the intricacies of this experience and how it plays out, right? How people who cause this type of harm on young people and specifically young boys, you know, convince them in ways that they're complicit in the process, right? And one of the things that I like to emphasize, and it's really difficult for men, because one of the big differences between the way that men experience it, or specifically the, the, uh, in, as opposed to girls or boy, uh, um, women, is that the disclosure process, right? So we know, like the research shows that like the disclosure process is much more prolonged for boys. And one of the things that I think contributes to that is when you have someone who causes this harm and your body responds to it. And your body responds to it. You may become aroused and they say, see, I told you you liked it. I told you you liked this. And as a child, you don't know that that's just simply biology, that your body is just naturally responding to something. Your head is already checked out. And if we're talking about fight or flight, we also talk about freeze, and we can also talk about submit, because that's another trauma re response. So your body is, your mind is checked out and your body is responding, but in your little child brain, you feel like I brought this onto myself. And now you couple that with all of these ideas of masculinity, right, manhood, that you've internalized so early, and you feel like you're a failure because you haven't protected your body, even though you're a child, right? And you feel tremendous shame. The shame that keeps you isolated, the shame that keeps you from disclosing to people and telling people what happened to you. And then if you add into that, the fact that boys are much less likely to be believed than girls when they disclose that they've experienced sexual abuse, right? That makes the situation even more traumatic, right? Because now you find the courage to share with someone and then in that experience, if they respond in a way that makes you feel like you are culpable or something is wrong with you and, and you pick that up, it shuts you down even further. And so what we see is like for men, many of them go through their entire life, their entire lives, struggling, trying to mitigate the symptoms of PTSD. And I want to talk about that as well um, in, in order to just like make it. But it's too overwhelming. And that's why when you have a show like you, you saw on Oprah's show and she had 250 men, even in the video that we just saw, these are men who are adults are now talking about it. When you look at the Catholic church sex scandals and people are saying, why did he wait till he was 50 years old to start talking about it, right? It took that long to get the courage to talk about it based Absolutely. on when you're talking about social norms, right? Exactly, exactly. And so all of these things that I'm saying are taking are interplaying in a way that's putting this person on a path of all types of self-destructive behaviors based on the symptoms of, of trauma that, that, that Lisa so you know, clearly like pointed out, right? People are struggling with substance abuse, people are struggling with like you know, uh, hypersexuality, right? And ways that like are engaging in risky behaviors and doing all of these things. There's like a lot of self-destructive behavior that they're engaging in. And it isn't until a lot of instances you see that a person will find themselves, you know, overdosing before they start talking about it and getting out or incarcerated. And in my experience, it wasn't until my incarceration when I hit the low, right? And I found myself in a situation where other people who shared that experience, who just so happened, they just felt the courage to talk about it in a, in a space that we created in prison by other men who were incarcerated that it opened it up for me and made me feel safe and comfortable enough to disclose and talk about my experience of sexual abuse. But up until then, there were all of these behaviors that were labeled, that were uh, demonized, and that were ultimately criminalized, right? That no one had the chance and no one took the chance and not even understood the need to want to ask me what happened to me. And so when I think about this, I talk about how they pathologize black and brown trauma responses, right? Where the trauma responses, the excessive aggressiveness, the exaggerated sense of masculinity that comes 
as like a means to try to mitigate these fears of being considered, considered effeminate or gay. If we start to do these things to like overcompensate because we felt like this violation that we experienced early on kind of compromised our manhood. So we engage in these behaviors that are feeble efforts to try to overcompensate, but play themselves out in, as aggressive and violent behaviors because that's also the general narrative of what a man is supposed to do, supposed to be, right? And so you couple that and then you find this person, you know, in a situation where all of those behaviors that were simply trauma responses are being uh, criminalized and this person is being incarcerated. That's why I talk about the trauma to prison pipeline, right? And it's not a coincidence. One of the things I did with my, um, a pilot study that I did for my dissertation research was I interviewed school social workers um, in elementary schools. And that was intentional because I wanted to, you know, the onset of sexual abuse for males is roughly between age eight and 10, right? And so you hear boy, uh, you know, I wanted to hear from the school social workers because the way that I understood it is that sometimes, especially for black and brown boys, the first encounter that they have with a mental health professional is in the school setting, right? And so who better to interview and understand what their experience is like serving male survivors, specifically black and brown um, student survivors of sexual abuse. And what I found is that these social workers who in their defense, many are overworked, right? You have school districts with one social worker who's supposed to be the social worker for every school in that district, right? Um, you have this social worker who doesn't even have the wherewithal when Raheem is acting out and exhibiting symptoms of his PTSD as a result of his traumatization that was sexual, rooted in sexual abuse, they don't even have the wherewithal to ask him. And the other thing that I wanted to look at is like, how does race influence their perception? How does gender and like patriarchy influ influence their perception, right? Because there's a such thing just as much as there's a such thing as internalized racism, there's internalized patriarchy. And so the school social workers that I interviewed who were women, which the majority of social workers are women, they didn't even think to consider the boy as susceptible and vulnerable to sexual abuse because of their internalized patriarchy, right? But when a little girl started acting out, the first thing they thought was like, what's happening at home? Is someone touching you? Whereas this little boy, there was like this behavior is being disrupted. And then if you add into this a racial analysis and think about the role that race plays, and the narrative that we've been saying for, for many years rooted in white supremacy and, and racism in this country that black men specifically are uncivilized, they're innately criminal, right? All of these negative notions that we have about black men to produce the tremendous amount of fear that's ubiquitous in our society, even black people being fearful of other black, black men, you know? And so now you incorporate that into this space and this social worker is, is, is leading with an analysis that's rooted in her unchecked bias because she hasn't really thought about the ways that she might have internalized this racism in a way that she can start to stereotype this boy and believe that there's something, right? And one of the social workers actually in the interview said, you know, he's from downtown, that's what they do. And what she was referring to is downtown was a neighborhood that was, you know, in, would, had a lot of poverty right? And as a result of that poverty, they had a lot of proximity violence and everything. So she had already thought about it from the perspective of race and socioeconomic status. And that was influencing her per perception of this young boy, right? And then you couple that with the gender analysis and internalized patriarchy and not feeling like boys are, are just as vulnerable and susceptible to harm as girls. And you know what you have. Okay, you have so a I'm bunch of boys who are not getting the support and the treatment that they need to heal. They're not even being asked what happened to you, right? But this is really so, good segue too, because I want to give an opportunity for the audience to ask questions and for our panel to um, ask you questions or have a discussion because okay. mm -hmm. um, the reason why I said that is because Lindsay is going to talk about how the system re-traumatizes those youth, those adults. And my... Um, my whole thing is, for me, it's like I work with youth, I work with adults, um, and when I work with the youth, I'm always, I'm all, because I'm a survivor, I'm always in tune 
with what's going on with someone who's been sexually violated and kids. And I don't, I don't want to say that I got some radar for it or anything. I just kind of look at the symptoms uh, and I ask questions like, um, how are you doing? What's going on with you and things of that nature. And I have saved um, at least in my, in my understanding, 20 kids um, from being sexually abused at home, you know, put into a, a better um, situation. Also, but, but Larice, let me say one more about... thing. Let me say one more thing before we go into the question. I just want to emphasize this point. Um, and I was just, mode. yeah, I was just talking um, uh, one of my colleagues and um, researcher, Dr. Shin, Sean Jenright, um, and it's related to this, you know, the the diagnosis of post traumatic uh, stress disorder. Um, a couple things that are happening. So one of the groups I'm working with, Men Healing, um, which focuses on, has been for the last 32 years, serving male survivors of sexual abuse. And other folks are trying to make this shift from post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Which means, because it's essentially saying that you have a disorder, you have a series of symptoms, this is something, there's something wrong with you to post-traumatic injury, right? Because an injury, there's something that can happen to you that can hurt you, but it also gives a sense of hope and the possibility for healing, right? So you don't have to be the sum total of your trauma with this diagnosis. I know that there's a lot of medical insurance, you know, aspects of this, and that's the re that's the way that we are. We're actually getting the pushing to have this change in the DSMs as well. And then Dr. Sean Jimwright talks about post-traumatic um, stress environment. And so this trauma, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's proximity violence, right, does not happen in a vacuum. And that's the other thing that we have to take into consideration too, Right, because it's this child experiencing sexual abuse in an, on an interpersonal level, but then they also experiencing proximity violence. They're also experiencing a race-based trauma. Right, they're also experiencing uh, pr police profiling and and targeting and abuse that's coming from law enforcement who they're supposed to trust. Right, so it's like the experience of trauma is ubiquitous, specifically for Black and Brown people. That the question come, becomes, how do you heal? in the midst of consistent. And so we even talk about that by not even using the term post because it's not post because it's consistent, Current. right? It's persistent. And we talk about persistent traumatic stress disorder. We talk about complex traumatic stress disorder because it's inclusive of all of these other ways in which they're being traumatized in their community. You, are you aware of post-incarceration syndrome that their they're, um, stress syndrome? Like, yeah, that because that's what institutionalization is. And I like a lot of things that you and um, Lisa spoke about because you're addressing a couple of things. Like one, um, the developmental of the brain for someone who has been consistently traumatized throughout their life, someone like myself, you can't expect them to have, um, according to their age, maturity, emotional, high emotional IQs, high decision-making IQs. So at 14, I get pregnant with my daughter. And the reason why I keep her is because I want somebody to love me that's healthy, right? Not thinking once she's going to grow up to be an adult one day and make her own decision and, and, and treat me you know, we have an estranged relationship because I was incarcerated, even though I was incarcerated defending our lives, it didn't make a, a, a difference. She felt abandoned. What my family needed was intervention, not incarceration. And, and it also addresses the issue of SROs in schools. So we got enough money to police police officers in schools, but not enough money to put social workers in schools and deal with the um, trauma, um, and the traumatic environment of our youth. So we're we're traumatizing um, our youth in urban communities, not just in their in their environment. We're traumatizing them in their education system. We're traumatizing them through the juvenile courts. We're traumatizing them through the criminal courts. And furthermore, as a society, we are using their life trauma as entertainment, and then we want to pose. Um, punitive, still punitive policies to incarcerate our youth, which for young girls, it is a, a form of feminine sterilization. Because anytime you sent as a 14 year old to 20, 30, 40 years, when she come out, she can't bear children. 
And if she does, it's at a high risk. So what are we really doing when we say we're trying to keep our society safe and secure when all we're doing is re-traumatizing and perpetuating post-traumatic stress, um, not disorder, but um, post-traumatic stress and post-incarceration stress and this high environment of traumatization. And Lindsay's going to talk about, is first of all, is there anyone who has any questions before we get Lindsay on to talk about how the system traumatizes us? Well, I just want to, you know, the, the whole notion of being punished for being wounded. Uh, Richard, you're describing you know, that intersection between trauma, which has its own range of outcomes, but then early sexual violence, which has its own layer, which you described as shame, which you described as causing self-harm, that, that lens pointed at self, you know, punished for being wounded, that punishment also comes from your own sense of shame, right? The punishment you're inflicting on yourself, which is often a quiet punishment. Uh, we, so there's so many powerful notions that are coming together here, and it just leads me to think, you know, if we are, we can be so clear about how it is that A leads to B leads to C, right, in terms of the science, the research, how the brain works, how is it that when we then start making policy about these important issues, we abandon all of those notions at the door, and our own sense of shame, of the otherness, all the things that you're describing almost takes over. We forget what we know and we respond with those visceral reactions, right? That are that that really are, are so often guiding our response to so much of the policy that we make, the way that we fund and the way that we treat other people. There's almost a, a, a necessary humanism that we have to engage in here, right? Believe in the healing of others, the possibility of others to heal, and then the good work can begin. So, so many resonant messages there, Richard. I just wanted to kind of bring those up to the fore because I think it's gonna resonate with a lot of people who are watching, not just people who may be experiencing the results of that trauma, but also people who wanna do good work around it. Right, like the policymakers who are watching in um, not just in Connecticut, but nationally, because our last episode went national, and we know this one will too. And we really do need to be, thank you, Steve, for bringing that up, cognizant when we're creating policy. I truly believe that um, there, and anybody up to the age of 25 should not be fully um, charged as an adult, be, especially those who have experienced consistent trauma and haven't been diagnosed properly. Like there, there should be something said about raising the age to 25 for, for a, a, a protected class of, of groups of people, which happen to be the poor um, minorities, black and brown youth and, and get more services transitioning in to the education, the um, after school programming, introducing more arts, unless um, you, we can't afford to do the arts because we need the police. How about we use one secure, well, we use one police officer to work with the security in the school and get more arts program and more social workers because we can save ourselves by not punishing our children who will later on become adults with the same issues, but teaching them how to cope with their trauma and not wait until they're in jail or the juvenile justice system, but catching them early and saving not just their lives, but our future. And that's real safety and security. Lindsay, wonderful lady, can you introduce yourself and let us know what you're gonna talk about today? Uh, sure, I wish I could keep listening though, cause I've just so enjoyed the whole discussion so far. And, um, I'm Lindsay Rosenthal. I'm the director of the Bureau Institute of Justice's initiative to end girls incarceration, which is working to zero out incarceration for girls nationwide by 2030. Um, and the last panel that you all had really went in depth in the sexual abuse to prison pipeline report that I wrote. So I'm not planning to talk about that. And I actually did have um, some slides prepared, but I think I'm going to present my material in conversation with everything that's already been discussed because there's just so much overlap. So first of all, I just, Richard, so appreciated when you said we can't talk about sexual abuse without talking about gender, without talking about race, without talking about the role of toxic masculinity and just the ways that we invisibilize based on those social structures, right? And one thing that often gets invisibilized in these conversations is that 
40% of young people in girls juvenile justice facilities identify as LGBT GNC. They disproportionately experience sexual violence, right? The whole gender spectrum, the way that it intersects with um, experiences of sexual abuse. But the history and the, the legacy of race and the intersection of racism, mass incarceration, and sexual abuse against people of color is one that I wanna lift up. So a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the National Memorial for Peace and Justice at the Legacy Museum in Montgomery. And one of the stories that you can read about there is um, Cecilia, who was a young black girl at 14, who was sold as a slave to a white man named Robert Newsom, who subjected her to repeated rape, um, which was the routine experience of, of black people who were enslaved in the United States is that they were forced to bear children. They were separated from their families, men, women, all genders of black people, right? This is part of the fabric of social control in slavery. Um, and she told him that if he raped her again, she, she would defend herself. Um, and the next time he attempted to rape her, she killed him. And in the court proceedings that followed, the judge refused to allow self-defense to be considered for the jury consideration. Um, she was convicted by a jury of 12 white men, and then she was hung for the crime of killing her abuser in and her and, and Robert Newsom, this man who enslaved her on December 21st, 1855. And the day that I visited that museum and, and read about her story, was reminded of her story, um, was the day actually that Centoya Brown was granted clemency in her case. And I couldn't help but think about the parallels between her experience at 16 um, being incarcerated for killing a 43 year old white man who paid $150 to buy her for sex without any consideration of the context um, that was, was bringing her into the justice system. And it was stories like that that one made me and my co-authors want to focus on just centering girls of color. It's why we do the work that we do to focus on the initiative to end girls incarceration. Um, getting to zero for girls who are often left out of conversations about mass incarceration again because of the ways that you know we divide our communities and our struggles based on these lines that have been created and we need to constantly be doing the work to undo that which is what I've just so appreciated partly about this conversation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, you know, having laid out that just historical context that's really important and how it's showing up right now to talk about um, why, how systems currently in, in criminalizing young people, specifically how they replicate some of the experiences of abuse and, um, and listening to Dr. Fanta's talk, um, you know, we, trauma is fundamentally about powerlessness, right, and taking away power. Um, and, you know, we talked about earlier in, in Dr. Fanta's presentation how the way that sexual abuse happens is through isolation and through control. And she really broke in, down in detail how that happens. And when kids are systems that are supposed to take care of them, schools, child welfare systems are failed, are failing them and they act out um, or, or not, or they're just being <laughs> teenagers and they're, they're struggling with trauma. Right, we respond in ways that replicate the exact behavior of abuse. We punish them, we isolate them, control them. Um, so they're put in facilities where they have no control over their bodies. They are you know, made to shower in front of people. Um, they are told that the system is there to help them and that the system knows what's best for them and that they need to behave in all of these ways that you know, the system lays out for them. Um, and they're co coerced into accepting help that is not aligned necessarily with, with what they need, right? So um, one young person in one of the sites where we worked um, had said she was being sexually abused by her father, um, and as a, and, but, but it wasn't substantiated by the abuse investigation. Um, and so she was running away from home and eventually got in trouble with the juvenile justice system. And despite this history and her saying that her father or her stepfather was sexually abusing her, she was mandated to participate in family therapy that he was taking part of. And the focus was on changing her behavior and she was not believed about the harm that was happening to her. 
And so she would run away and she wouldn't show up to these court mandated therapy sessions and she would continue to get in more and more trouble all because the, the very act of diverting her by focusing on trying to fix her behavior with therapy instead of focusing on the context that she was living in, believing her about the abuse that was happening to her, believing the structural context that she was operating in just fundamentally was, was doing the, was replicating exactly the abuse that he was, he was doing to her. And so, um, that story, I think, is instructive for the fact that the way that we need to transform systems is to listen to survivors, to understand their experiences, to pay attention to what their needs are, and to let those needs govern the responses that we have. So, Dr. Fontes, you said, you know, the message that we want young people who have been sexually abused to have is you are capable, you are capable, you are lovable we will make the world safe for you. And inherent in that is, is just a trust in who young people are, um, that they are capable of telling us what they need and that when they tell us, we should listen to them. And I think that's inherently the value that our, our, our program seeks to bring to systems is that we should divest from spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to incarcerate kids and instead invest in systems that are accountable for um, providing meaningful healing and support and following young survivors in, in meeting their needs and, and truly healing. And so um, we work with a professor at NYU called Dr. Jav Shanam Javdani. And one of the things that she's lifted up in her research is that only 50% of the factors associated with juvenile delinquency are individual or environmental. The rest are structural, things like race and gender. And yet almost all of our interventions to address incarceration of kids focus on the individual kids and the individual families and changing their behavior. And what we ask systems to do is to also focus on the structural context that is driving young people and families into the system, addressing lack of access to housing, addressing poverty, addressing inequity in school, and addressing the ways that our child welfare system isn't equipped to support families and is instead, you know, often offering punishment. One of the things that, you know, we do in our sites is, is review um, case files of every young person that's been incarcerated so that we can really understand the story of what's happening and lift that up for, for system actors. And um, one of the things, you know, that we often see is that there's been like 10 unsubstantiated abuse reports in the past to the child welfare system. And I say unsubstantiated, sometimes they're substantiated, but there's just been repeated contact with the child welfare system and there's never been a response. And that doesn't mean the response is take young people away from their families, but it does mean, what are we offering to families? There's something going on. What is, what is healing support look like upstream before we get to this place where we're criminalizing young people and just focusing on on this immediate context of this one child who may have run away from school or gotten in a fight. Um, so, so that's the fundamental shift that we're trying to make. And I hope that was articulate is to, is to really focus on self-determination of survivors individually, but then also at a community level, right? The same principle applies. If, if we take seriously that communities of color um, have been treated this way, have been abused by systems, controlled by systems, and that's intersecting with sexual violence and all kinds of other things as Richard lifted up, you know, how are we engaging communities and understanding what they need to heal collectively? What are, they, what are the investments they need to see? How are we listening to survivors and communities that um, have experienced systemic oppression for so long? Um, thank you, thank you Lindsay. Um, you gave us a lot of food for thought and you brought it all together. And uh, I know Steve is going to eloquently put this all together, you know, because um, he's just so sharp like that. I am going to say, yes, I remember feeling going to therapy at 11 about some of the abuse that happened to us. My mother had us hypnotized. And at 11, we went to therapy because uh, she started becoming abusive. And I remember telling the therapist all the things my mother said and did, and she would be right there. And I would be have enough courage to say, this was going on. And my mom would be like, she's crazy. She's been like this. She tells stories. And 
and the therapist would believe her. And that kept me from going back to therapy until I became incarcerated. The other things you everybody has mentioned, which is very important is, and someone in the um, watching live made this statement, our brains are not fully, our writing wrong decision-making skills are not fully developed until we're 25. Imagine those with traumatic experience. I personally feel like my frontal cortex and my ab abdubla gala is, is starting to mature at 49 because of the extensiveness of my um, abuse in, in my childhood, in my teens. I got game being raped at CCSU when I was 13 during a, a snowstorm. Like there has never, I used to think, again, self-image. I used to think that it said rape me on my forehead because I got raped every five years of my life. And then furthermore, to bring this all to a helm, although there were moments of people in my life who said I was worthy and I was and I was a good person and I was super smart, the majority of the people surrounding me were not that supportive. Until this day, it's still the same way. Um, so there is a difference, I wanna say to a lot of our survivors, there's a difference between family and relatives. And I have learned that difference. Today, I'm here talking to you with a family that I created because of an issue. And we will always be family because you guys are that important to me because you're bringing awareness to people like me and making sure we get heard and that we get help and we get healed. And Steve, you can introduce our Kelvin Young, if you like. Larice, thank you so much. You know, I, I, have, to, I have to tell you, it's, it's rare that we can actually say at the end of a presentation like today's that uh, I really invite our viewers to just go back and, and listen and watch again. Um, this has been a masterclass in really drawing those connections between early violence, especially early sexual violence, and the long-term uh, impacts that it can have when unaddressed. It's also critically important to understand that each of us is capable of healing. Each of us is capable of being agents in that healing, and that there is not one of us who is a throwaway individual, regardless of our experience. So I just wanna thank each and every one of you. And before uh, we part today, I wanna to introduce all of you uh, to Kelvin Young. Kelvin, you have been a frequent visitor with us. And you know, I, I think you understand um, probably more intimately than any of us here, why we keep inviting you back, especially during difficult conversations, because it's important for us on this call and it's important for those who may be viewing after these conversations to take time of self-reflection, of meditation, and really healing, uh, because it is so critical, not only to that moment, but also to moving forward. So Kelvin, I'd, I'd love to invite you uh, to the front of the room uh, to help us in some of that guided uh, introspection. Thank you so much, Stephen, for this opportunity to just be here and to uh, gain all the wisdom that was shared today by Larice. Hello, Larice, how you doing? Thank you so much for, for sharing your heart, sharing your truth to all of us, um, to Richard, to Dr. Lisa, Lindsay, uh, Denise. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to be here and just blessing me with your, your knowledge and your wisdom about this very uh, intimate but yet informative uh, conversation. I have a friend, Nikki Myers. Uh, she's the founder of, of Yoga and 12-Step Recovery. She often says that our issues live in our tissues. And I find that to be very, very true. Uh, the trauma that we experience in our life, the, those emotions that we suppress or repress, it's in our bodies, it's in our muscles, it's in our tissues. Our cells have memory and our body keeps score of all of our experiences that we go through in our lives. And I often work with people that, that experience a significant amount of trauma in their life. And oftentimes they reach for alcohol and other drugs to gain a sense of relief from that distress. And the thing I like about sound healing is sound healing the vibrations and frequencies and tones that penetrates to the cellular level and helps to release some of that stuck energy or trauma that's in our bodies. And oftentimes it's released in a form of tears, which is a beautiful thing. And, you know, having the opportunity to really reflect with the vibrations and sounds and frequency, which you're about to do after this uh, very powerful conversation, it's just an honor to be here today. So thank you again for this moment uh, to reflect and use sound to help us to ground us and root us into uh, this moment. 
So at this time, I invite you to get into a comfortable uh, position, whatever that means for you. And I invite you to either close your eyes or bring a soft gaze to the floor. Whatever feels most safe and comfortable for you, I invite you to do so at this moment. As we take this time to check in with ourselves, notice any sensations that we might be feeling within our bodies, any thoughts that might have become into our conscious awareness, or any emotions that might have been felt during this conversation. As we take this time to simply just be. As we take this opportunity to relieve stress, find inner peace and balance through the transformative powers of sound. I now invite each and every one of you to take a nice deep breath in and a long breath out. We'll do this two more times. Take a nice deep breath in. And a long breath out. One more time, take a nice deep breath in. And a long breath out. And at this time, I invite you to bring your focus, your attention and awareness to the sound you hear and the comfort of your space. If your mind happened to drift away to, you know, that infamous to-do list for all those text messages and emails you got to respond to, or any other stressors or responsibilities in our life. I invite you to gently bring your focus, your attention, and awareness back to the sounds. Allow the sounds to be your anchor into the present moment. Allow it to be a gentle reminder to each and every one of us that the only time that we truly have on this journey that we call life is now.
and when you're ready, and only when you're ready, you may open your eyes. Thank you so Namaste. much, everyone. Namaste, Kevin, my Namaste. other great eight 2020. <laughs> you already Kevin, know. Thank you so much for that answer, though. I just Very want welcome. to remind everybody that on November 18th, we're going to have part three, which is disability and mental health, how sexual violence creates um, mental health disabilities. And we need to um, come together and find out what laws protect us and what laws don't. We're going to have um, Debbie. Dorfman from Disability Rights Connecticut on and Denise, I believe we're going to have a Michael. Is that correct? Coming on, he's going to talk about um, sexual violence and disabilities. He's a minister. And um, we're going to have Cindy, who is an advocate for sexual people who are um, who have been sexually violated and those who um, have been accused of sexual violence and um, and are on the registry as youth um, who are now adults. So who is the other guy, Denise? Let the people know so we get excited. <laughs> well, it hasn't been confirmed yet, so I'll, I'll fill you in with that. Okay, Great. well, I'm going to confirm him but because um, I trust that he'll come through. But I just want to thank you guys again for um, joining us today. Stay tuned, November 18th, mark your calendars, 4 p.m. to 5.30, disability and mental health on sexual abuse to prison pipeline, the forgotten, and take us home, Steve. Thank Thanks, you everyone. all. Thank you, uh, Richard and Lisa and Lindsay, uh, so much for guiding us through this uh, really powerful conversation. Uh, Denise um, and, and Werner, thank you so much for organizing, uh, again, what is the continuation of a, of, a, of, a, of a nourishing and important conversation. Uh, and, and Kelvin, uh, thank you for, for guiding us into that moment of healing uh, as we wrap up. Larissa, you're a superstar. Uh, let's um, continue to co-host these, these powerful conversations. Thank you uh, for your self-advocacy and advocacy on behalf of others. And thank you all tonight for watching. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night.